Good morning. I'm Helen Christians and I'll be your MC this morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday morning meeting of the Humanists of Greater Portland. If anyone's new to HGP Sunday morning meetings, I want to warmly welcome you. And uh, I'm glad that you're all here. Uh, the Humanists of Greater Portland is a chapter of the American Humanists Association. Humanism is an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of all human beings. Humanists seek to find common values and respect among people rather than emphasizing differences. Humanists seek rational ways to solve human problems in local communities as well as, as our, our, the major problem uh, in the world. Uh, these include climate change and, and certainly the brutal attacks on Ukraine uh, through science, reason, and free inquiry. The American Humanists Association has developed a list of 10 commitments, and, and these 10 commitments are a general guide that put humanism into action. Our topic at today's meeting, homeless youth, will address most of the humanist commitments, especially social justice, service, empathy, and altruism. A full list of the 10 commitments can be found on the um, Humanists of Greater Portland and the American Humanists Association websites. HGP is an all volunteer group that believes strongly in freedom of speech, but I must state that the views expressed by myself, our, our reader today, our speaker, HGP members, and our guests at today's meeting are not the official views of the Humanists of Greater Portland. Our reader today is right here beside me, Al Christians. Welcome, Al, and it's going to be, uh, I'd like you to do a reading, and uh, you're doing it on uh, in honor of uh, Women's Month. Right? I'm wearing purple. The purple is the official color of Women's History Month. Okay. And um, the reason I'm doing this is nobody else signed up, and I had to <laughs> mesh together three different sources last night, some Wikipedia, some an article from Der Spiegel, mostly from the book Berlin 1961 by Frederick Kemp, who's a big, big, big time journalist. Um, and this is um, about a, uh, a, a German woman in, in uh, 1961 when uh, people were fleeing East Germany, uh, rapidly going to West Germany and the East German economy was about to collapse from the loss of all the, all the people, all the, all the uh, valuable people who are moving to West Germany. And this, this, this is their story. And I've compressed it quite a bit, but it's still a little long, so I'm reading fast. <laughs> she was Walter Ulbricht's ultimate humiliation. Ulbricht was a uh, head of the East German government. As the communist leader maneuvered behind the scenes to close his Berlin border, one of his refugees was strutting down the catwalk of a Miami Beach stage in her Miss Universe crown. Amid the flashing of cameras, Ulbricht's most intractable problem had assumed the unmistakable shape of someone the judges had declared the world's most beautiful woman. At age 24, Mar Marlena Schmidt was intelligent, radiant, blonde, a little shy and a lot statuesque. West Germany's Der Spiegel magazine described her as someone with an electrical engineer's brain, master's degree in engineering, atop a Botticelli figure. But her real draw, the one that was getting her headlines around the globe, was the story of her fairy tale flight to freedom. It had been only a year since Marlena had fled Jena, a East German town flattened by Allied bombing during World War II and gutted by Soviet expro creation then made bland co and colorless by communist central planners. Her new West German home of Stuttgart was a world apart. West Germany's post-war economic miracle had transformed the city into a hilly green broom town. A recent refugee, Marlena entered the Miss Germany contest drawn by a newspaper advertisement that first prize would be a French Renault convertible. After winning the car in a, the luxurious spa town of Baden-Baden, Marlena in Florida surpassed 47 competitors to become Germany's first and only Miss Universe. Marlena's triumph was projected to the world in Technicolor from a pageant organized and produced by Paramount Pictures. 
Tens of thousands of East Germans watched as well the product of thousands of antennae on rooftops that allowed most of the country to pull down the West German television signal. They hung on every detail. Marlena, who was earning $53 a week as an electrical engineer in a Stuttgart research factory, spoke of her excitement over her Miss Universe winnings that included $5,000 in cash, a $5,000 mink coat, a $10,000 personal appearances contract, and a complete wardrobe. World attention forced Obrecht's propaganda apparatus to react. The official communist youth publication, Young World, accused the Americans of rigging the beauty contest to call attention <laughs> to East Germany's refugee problem. It sneered at how the West German media had falsely created a Soviet zone Cinderella who had been saved from half-starved communism by the Golden West, saying East Germans valued her for her engineering and socialist education. Now all that matters are her bust, butt, and hips. She's no longer to be taken seriously. She's just a display piece. Marlena shrugged in resignation. I would expect to hear this from them. I think it's uncomfortable for the East German government to have the world reminded of the situation in East Germany. The East Germany press responded by calling her triumph one of the short-lived pleasures of capitalism that would quickly fade away to be followed by a hard life in an unfriendly land. You only reign one year, after which the world will forget you. In this case, each East German propaganda proved partially right. Der Spiegel said, for a year, she traveled from place to place every day. She, we went from the airport to the TV station, from there to key handovers, awards, or any other event. She almost stopped this, stopped this show pr prematurely. In 1962, she had become the third among the eight wives of Hollywood actor Ty Harden, star of the Western television series Bronco. She divorced him four years later, and only after that, she ran up 11 movie credits, credits as an actor, writer, or producer, but they included little of note, falling mostly in the skin fest genre. <laughs> I learned that life in Hollywood was not for me, she said, reflecting on her decision to move back home with her daughter and work on electrical engines in Saarbrücken. When she left East Germany, however, Marlene's choice had been between freedom and prison. She was running from arrest for assisting others who had also tried to leave. The flight to the West had been her salvation. Marlene Schmidt would wear her universe crown for less than a month before Obricht moved to close the escape hatch through which she and so many others had passed. Today, Marlene is 84 years old, divorced for the second time, takes care of the house and garden alone, and enjoys the freedom. She would not accept the invitation to the 50th anniversary of her Miss Universe election, saying, my daughter is expecting her first child. My grandson is more important to me than any Miss election. <laughs> thank you, Leo. Thank you so much, and thank you for recognizing Women's History Month. That was very nice. All right, if any of any HGP member would like to do a reading at future HGP meetings um, and also save my husband on Saturday night going, ah, there's nobody speaking, I got to come up with something, please log into HGP website at portlandhumanist.org and under the member tab, you will see a tab for sign up sheets. Sign up in an open spot and please limit your reading <laughs> to about three minutes. I think Gail went a little overboard there, but uh, he read fast. So I hope you got that story. Well, I'm going to introduce today's um, speaker, which we are in for a wonderful treat. Uh, uh, Dr. Don Schwartz is a associate professor of social work at um, Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I think I said his name. I got nervous. Dr. Don Schweitzer is an associate professor of social work at Pacific University. Dr. Schweitzer has worked both as a practitioner and a researcher with adults and youth who are experiencing homelessness. Homelessness. His current research focuses on understanding uh, the challenges and barriers experienced by marginalized youth. He believes that current policy and treatment responses to youth homelessness frequently exacerbates the problems of these adult, these youth and create obstacles 
to genuine care, forcing these young people to into high risk living arrangements. Um, welcome. Uh, and please come on in. We're in for a, we're in for a very a big treat. This is going to be a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thank you for that uh, introduction, Helen, uh, and thank you for this invitation to uh, speak to you this morning about a, a topic that's really important to me, and I, I think is really important to a lot of folks here. Uh, and I, I want to start by uh, thanking everyone for my uh, <laughs> Great Portland coffee mug here. Oh, so. you got it already. Yeah, so we can just sip some coffee and have a little conversation this morning. Uh, I'm gonna, <clears throat> well, I guess right before I start, I'll, I'll just uh, add a little bit to what um, Helen had said. Uh, you know, she mentioned I'm uh, associate pro professor at Pacific University. Uh, before that, I, I worked in the field as a social worker. I'm a social work professor, uh, both working in the adult uh, homeless population initially, and then um, uh, ran a uh, uh, runaway and homeless youth shelter. We had a transitional living program and a mental health clinic uh, there on site. And as I kind of shared a little bit at the beginning with the group, um, as a social worker, I, I started my career with the adult homeless population, but I always kept looking upstream, like, well, how can we choke off the supply lines to what's creating uh, homelessness? And that kind of drew me to working with the, the runaway and homeless youth population. Uh, you know, from there, though, even from there, I could see some some pretty major institutions that um, that we have in our society that I thought were um, exacerbating uh, the, the problem or at a minimum could could maybe be doing more to help uh, young folks as they uh, you know, as they age and navigate th this world, a uh, very complicated world we now live in. Um, <clears throat> And so that's just kind of a, a bit about me trying to uh, get to the sources of these problems and seeing if we can, um, you know, really uh, make a difference. And so this morning, I'm going to kind of do a real brief overview, really broad, um, to, tr to try to give folks kind of a sense, some, some information, maybe if you're not familiar with this, this situation, give, me, give you enough information that you can, you know, to, to kind of encourage some questions from you, some additional questions, so I don't go too deep into anything. Uh, again, just trying to give a, a broad overview and then uh, letting your questions kind of guide uh, the specific areas you'd, you'd like to know more about and, and if I could help. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I've got a, a presentation uh, I'm gonna do. And yeah, for any reason, uh, can't hear me or something goes awry, please don't hesitate to um, just yell out at me to stop or wait kind of thing. Okay, so I gotta get some screens because I'm, I'm not gonna have um, the ability to see anybody uh, for this. So, um, all right, so for today, um, I gotta make sure my cursor's in the right place. So uh, today, eh, you guys did. Uh, so an overview of, uh, of Runaway and Homeless Youth. This is kind of this acronym that's been around for quite a few years, RHY. Uh, sometimes you see it as HRY, um, but stands for Runaway Homeless Youth. I'm going to talk about the, the federal response. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, positive youth development. This is one of the main um, kind of theoretical uh, perspectives of working with young people comes from this positive youth development framework. I'm going to talk just about a couple of the pathways uh, that uh, young people kind of get into this involvement in the criminal justice system and the high school dropout rates. Um, of course, there's lots of other pathways and reasons that young people end up in, in this situation, uh, family uh, conflict, uh, economic strains, um, things of that nature. But these are the two I'm gonna uh, focus on today. <clears throat> some ideas about what we can do. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this restorative justice uh, in schools I know Portland Public Schools trying to implement this uh, in their school system now. And then again, time for Q&A. So I encourage you, if there's an area that you uh, thought I was gonna talk about and didn't, please feel free to ask that in the, in the Q&A. And, um, and anything that comes up that's not clear or uh, you'd like a little bit more information on, I'd be happy to answer those questions for you uh, as we, um, as, uh, at the end then. So, uh, all right, well, let's get started. So kind of this overview of uh, Runaway and Homeless Youth. And, um, Oh, and I'll mention, uh, I have a lot of sources and stuff in here. I'm happy to share my slides uh, with, uh, with you all so you're, you can go and uh, look at some of those sources. Um, 
So estimates are about 4.2 4 million youth per year uh, are experiencing homelessness in, in one way, shape or form. And the feds uh, define that up to about, uh, they look at this uh, youth all the way up to young adulthood around 22 to 24 years old. Um, but those estimates are almost double what they were uh, 10 years ago, or at least a million and a half more than they were uh, just 10 years ago. About 700 of those are actually unaccompanied minors. 50% uh, have been involved in the criminal justice system. That's why I want to kind of bring up that, talk a little bit more about that, because it's a really huge um, predictor of uh, young people ending up homeless. About a third were in foster care, and this has been something we've known for about 10 years that uh, a lot of uh, young people that age out of foster care uh, actually uh, end up homeless and in all, all kinds of uh, difficult uh, challenges. 27% are LGBT uh, questioning. Uh, and there are certainly risks that are associated when someone uh, decides to leave um, a family unit or um, or, or uh, ends up uh, otherwise ends up out in the street. So 36 to 50% report some type of sexual abuse, physical abuse or neglect or other form of maltreatment while they are out uh, uh, living um, homeless. 62% of LGBTQ youth report being physically harmed while experiencing homelessness. And according to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, one in three teens on the street will be lured into prostitution within 48 hours of uh, leaving home. And just overall risks, research uh, indicates higher rates of physical sexual victimization, suicide attempts, pregnancy, STDs, TB, and just overall more mortality rates are much higher for these uh, young folks uh, in this situation. So it certainly is, uh, while, while some young people certainly are leaving a situation that is dangerous for them, um, ending up uh, on the streets uh, may prove to be even more dangerous. So then uh, we have some theories about why this happened. And these are theories dating back to the 50s. And historically, it's really around the, the 50s is when we, uh, 40s and 50s, where we start seeing a, a, a federal response at, at some level, or, or at least recognizing this idea of runaway um, youth, which was, was most of what it was back at that time, it was just uh, concerned about uh, minors who, who would run away. From home, they weren't really focusing on on young people who were who were actually homeless. And so, some of these theories. So one theory is they're they're delinquent, and this is uh, Cohen strain theory, Mott's uh, drift theory, and control theory are three major um, theoretical perspectives. Uh, Cohen's first comes out in 1955. So Cohen strain theory depicted runaway and homeless youth as lashing out in dissatisfaction with the dominant class structure because they failed to achieve social status in large part due to education failures, which then led to low skill, low paying work. They attempted to obtain status by illicit means. Uh, Motz's drift theory uh, portrays, um, drift theory portrays uh, delinquent youth as drifting, quote, drifting into antisocial behaviors. Matza theorized that, young, uh, that youth gradually drift, drift into criminal behavior over time when feelings of desperation, uh, for example, uh, feeling loss of control over one's life are present. And then Impey's control theory described runaway and homeless youth as lacking internal controls uh, that would allow them to cope with their environments, a more emotional coping um, kind of mechanism. So strain theory, they're mentally ill. So the runaway uh, reaction, for anybody that's familiar with the DSMs, Diagnostic Statistical Manuals, this is where we get our mental health disorders. So in the DSM-3, there was this runaway reaction. Uh, and in the DSM-4 and 5, uh, we have a diagnosis of conduct disorder, which um, is still, uh, still just kind of presents them as um, there's something wrong with them. There's some kind of mental illness uh, going on. Uh, and then another uh, theory is it's just a normal response. And so this ecological developmental perspective um, it's uh, running away or throwing away, and throwing away is a term used when um, parents actually uh, kick the uh, young person out of their home. Uh, so running away or throwing away are normal responses to environmental stimuli, such as breaking the breakdown of the child-parent relationship, 
brought on by strain in resources, economics, job loss, loss of social support. Um, it just is really, uh, it starts to become uh, financial uh, pains really start um, playing a part according to this theory. And then the final um, one are they are disadvantaged. And so this risk amplification model, this idea that stressors pile up and they have a collective effect. So it explains these disadvantages experienced at early age will build up uh, upon those later in childhood and adolescence until ultimately there are few viable options, pro-social options left for youth to engage in society. And I kind of uh, put together, so this is a kind of a representation of that risk amplification model. So you can see these dark uh, boxes are like negative behaviors or negative situations. Um, so low birth weight, poor nutrition, aggressive coercive parenting, mental health disorder in the child, poor parenting and aggr uh, aggressive socialization. And really this, this one's a big rejection by conventional peers, which then kind of leads to the school failure, substance abuse, early arrest. And so Aziz, it's this idea that as these negative situations build up over time, they are cumulative upon each other. And then as they build up, the white bars present pro-social options that are available and open to young people. And they start to drift away as these kind of negative situations uh, go up. Uh, so that's the, the risk amplification model. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, kind of a theory around uh, why young people uh, run away. And so uh, this idea Orton and Soul back in the 80s kind of uh, developed this degrees of runners. And so we have this first degree runner. And this, this uh, young person is running from some condition, event or situation. This is oftentimes abuse or family conflict or parental substance use, things of those lines. These youth tend to be, remain emotionally connected to families even while on the run and readily return home if uh, that situation can be moderated in some way. And then we have second degree runners, uh, which are, um, they, are, they have previously run away. And so they are running from as well as to something. So these repeat runaway youth tend to be more emotionally disconnected from their families and are less enthusiastic about returning uh, to them. Because they have run away before, they have a sense of where they are running to and feel it is more acceptable than the current situation. And then we have our um, final, uh, and they are more emotionally disconnected from family. So third degree runners then, are they are only running to something. So these youth are mostly older adolescents who have uh, connected to the street culture and have no desire to, to engage in social services or return home. So these really then you would almost really kind of uh, refer to these youth that are now as uh, youth experiencing homelessness. So they have no intention of returning home. They're now um, uh, looking at more long-term solutions uh, for their situation. So then we have a federal response. And uh, as I said earlier, the, the, the first federal response, I think was uh, back in the 40s or 50s around the social, they amended the Social Security Act to allow for some monies to be used to help uh, essentially get young folks back home if they'd run away for somewhere. Um, and I think most people are familiar uh, with kind of the, the counterculture of the 60s. So this is where we really kind of see a ballooning of this issue. Um, you know, um, this, this kind of idea of, of young people were being, uh, were, were dissatisfied with, the, with society and status whole. And we have a lot of the very first uh, major uh, service providers for these folks starting out in San Francisco back in the late 60s. Uh, but then we have the Runaway and Homeless Youth Act, which was first uh, um, passed in 1974, and they established these basic centers. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these uh, specific ones. So in 74, they, um, they funded uh, basic centers. Um, and then in, in 1988, they added to the act a transitional living program. And then finally in 1994, a street outreach program. And so the idea of this uh, all put together is you have a street outreach program that is in working out on the streets, connecting with young people, developing relationships with them, trying to develop some trust. And then they're then working to either get them into a, a basic center uh, or a transitional living program. 
And that's um, essentially how the, the model we have uh, works uh, for the most part. Can, can, I, can I ask a kind of basic question? Yeah. Uh, what's the age limit for, for youth? Uh, one of the concerns is the uh, youth that are being forced out of the foster care program. Are they included in this or are they considered aged out for that also? No, they can, uh, and I'm gonna go through some specific ages that are associated with each one of those uh, federal responses here uh, in my next slides. But yes, foster youth, um, they, uh, just because they were in foster care, it does not disqualify them from any of these services. So if someone aged out of foster care and ended up homeless, that you know, one of these federal responses would, would work with them. So uh, it goes up to age uh, 22, uh, oh. even though most, uh, I think a lot of providers are going up to age 24 now. Okay, uh, thank, thank you. That's why I wanted to make sure that the, the age limit wasn't the same and that they would be excluded from both. <laughs> yeah, no, good question. And then even that, um, we could talk about foster, we're not going to talk much about foster care today, just uh, with limitation on time. But yeah, there's a huge problem with, with young people aging out. And, and this is uh, a lot of states have, have countered this by, well, it used to be 18. When they turned 18, it was like, well, good luck to you. Uh, but now they're allowed to uh, go up to age 21. Um, some states, and I think Oregon is one of these, though it's, um, it becomes an option for young people to stay in until 21. And uh, I don't know if anybody's, um, most young people do not want that, right? They've had uh, social services and all kinds of interventions just involved in their life uh, since they went into foster care and they're, 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 they're eager to get out from underneath that, um, you know, that system of care. So uh, I think what you'll, what you'll see when I've talked to some providers in Oregon, they talk about, yeah, when they turn 18, they leave, they, they don't want anything to do, but then uh, often, or it's, it's not unusual, once they turn about 20, they know they have about one year left of services, they will kind of come back and engage in some independent living program skills, which uh, programs, which is the federal response for older youth in foster care. Thank you. Thank so, you. Yeah, you bet. Uh -huh. uh, so, so these basic centers, so these are really runaway centers. So they're for 17 and younger. Um, they are, um, they're, they're time limited. They're 21 days. When, when I ran one of these programs, it was 14 days. And, uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. So services are kind of like outreach, crisis intervention, emergency shelter, counseling, family reunification, aftercare services uh, for, uh, for the youth and their families. And so the family reunification um, model was the, the, is the main kind of model of the basic center. And that's why the feds initially had it um, limited to 14 days, now 21, is the pressure is getting them back to the family as quickly as possible. And that's the real focus of this. And and as I uh, mentioned in that, in that earlier slide with those first degree runners, they go to these shelters. First degree runners are often the ones that go here. They, um, they are still emotionally connected to their families. And you know, with the help of um, mediation skills, we called it family mediation because families were more likely to engage in it if it was called that versus counseling. Um, and so we, we had pretty, pretty high success of uh, getting uh, young people back. So that's kind of the basic center, just really for the, the, the unaccompanied minors. And then these TLPs, so they run age 16 to 22, so they have a little tighter age limit and services are about one and a half to two years uh, a young person can uh, utilize services which include housing, counseling, life skills, interpersonal skill building, education advancement, job attainment. Uh, you know, in this kind of model, I mean, we're essentially becoming the family for this young person, right? These are the things that a family would hopefully be teaching a young person this time, you know, how to navigate the world, how to get jobs, how to you know, do bank accounts, um, you know, just how to kind of live uh, in, in this uh, increasingly complicated world that, that we live in. And so that's a, a lot of that. Um, but again, young people, uh, you know, they don't, as I don't like, I wouldn't like living in a, in a program like this, right? I mean, there's limitations on what they can do, what they can and can't do when they have to be home and things of that nature. And so some of those things, um, I think when I was there, the average stay was like around eight or nine months is how long a young person there. And that's about how long they can, you know, 
put up with the, the, the requirements. And, and that's about enough time that a uh, you know, young person can get a job, save up some money and um, can usually uh, find a place uh, as long as they're partnering with someone else, uh, you know, a roommate of some sort. Of course, roommates um, aren't necessarily the, <laughs> the answer that we always hope they'll be. Um, and then finally, the street outreach uh, programs. And a uh, street outreach program might also be a drop-in center. So street outreach, a true street outreach is like pairs of folks are out on the street, walk on the streets, go in the places where they think young folks are hanging out, again, building relationships, trying to steer them into uh, services kind of off, off the streets. But it can also be a drop-in center, which uh, these tend to be very low barrier um, uh, organizations. So as, as long as someone's not violent, and, you know, you can, you can come in and, uh, you know, they, they often have food. Sometimes they have um, uh, showers, laundry, things of that nature. Sometimes they even have um, uh, education programs associated with them. So if a young person wants to continue to kind of work on a GED or something of that nature, so that it allows for that. Um, whoops. And uh, it's, it's in, the, in the statute says for youth uh, 20 and younger uh, and services, basic needs such as food, clothing, hygiene, first aid, as well as information about services and safe places. When street outreach program was, was initially uh, passed, it was passed uh, with this, uh, with a lot of language around uh, sex trafficking in there, that, that, that in the, in the 90s we, we were becoming aware that a lot of these young people were being uh, drawn into prostitution um, when uh, when they first hit the street, and so so there is an emphasis on uh, looking. Uh, these folks should be trained in how to look for uh, sex trafficking going on as as well uh, in these. Okay, so that's kind of an overview, some services, some theories, some numbers. Um, and now I wanna talk about uh, positive youth development. And so this is a framework that uh, most youth serving organizations um, uh, work from when they're working with young people. And actually it's a framework that's been around for decades and decades. It's, it's a framework that uh, 4-H uh, actually was using, I think, as early as back in the 60s, they were developing this. And I don't know if folks are pr probably familiar with 4-H, um, although it tends to be more popular, I think, in rural, uh, um, rural areas. But it's a framework. And, um, but before I talk about uh, positive youth development, uh, I want to talk about the Pygmalion effect. And so this is a study that was done back in the 1960s. And, um, and I like this because I think it gives us a lot of um, some evidence for this positive youth development framework. Um, and it also lets us know that we've known about this for a long time. We, we know how to work with young people. Um, and, and I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later, but um, right now let's uh, watch this. Does it make a difference whether your teacher believes that you are a high performer or a low performer? that you are a late bloomer, that even though you haven't demonstrated your intellectual ability, you know, you, you will blossom, uh, or you're not a good student or you're a good student. Psychologist Robert Rosenthal and school principal Lenore Jacobson did a remarkable study some years ago in which they told school teachers, elementary school teachers, that on the basis of some uh, psychological tests, some of their students, some of the children in their class were designated as late bloomers, even though they hadn't shown any um, academic uh, success, they are expected to bloom. The amazing thing is that in a very short time, the teachers began to treat the children, those children differently than the other uh, kids. Those kids began to think of themselves differently. And in the end, they actually performed significantly better than the other kids. They were transformed by the teacher's positive expectations. The opposite of Jane Elliott's study in which teachers' negative expectations that the teacher infused led them to think of themselves as inferior. So let's see the Pygmalion effect in action in these classrooms set up by Rosenthal and Jacobson. Positive expectations can change a person's perception of a situation just as dramatically as negative expectations. Psychologists call this the Pygmalion effect after the George Bernard Shaw play of the same name. 
in which even an uneducated ragamuffin can be transformed into a proper society lady. In an experiment conducted at an elementary school like this one, psychologist Robert Rosenthal and school principal Lenore Jacobson took the Pygmalion effect one step further. What we wanted to show was the extent to which teachers' expectations could actually affect pupils' intellectual performance, for example, their IQ scores. So what we did was we tested everybody in a school with a test that pretended to be a test that would predict academic blooming, so-called Harvard test of inflected acquisition. And allegedly on the basis of that test, but not really, we gave each of the teachers in the school the names of a handful of children in her classroom that would get smart in the academic year ahead. These kids' names were taken out of a hat. We, we chose them by means of a table of random numbers. The children themselves did not know in any direct way that uh, teachers were holding certain expectations for them. Teachers were told not to tell the kids. And of course, we didn't tell the, the children either. So the children never knew. Six times something that's close to 32. Good, six times five. And then when we tested the children a year later, we found that those kids who'd been alleged to their teachers to be showing or going to show intellectual gains, in fact, showed greater intellectual gains than did the children of whom we'd said nothing in particular. So the kids actually got smarter when they were expected to get smarter by their teachers. Uh, we've come to feel that there are really four factors that operate in the mediation or communication of these self-fulfilling prophecies, especially in the classroom, but not only in the classroom. So what are these four things that teachers tend to do differently to kids for whom they have more favorable expectations? The first factor is the climate factor. Teachers tend to create a warmer climate for those children for whom they have more favorable expectations. Or it is nicer to them, both in terms of the things they say and also in the nonverbal channels of communication. The other uh, very important factor is the so-called input factor. That one probably won't surprise anyone. Teachers teach more material to those kids for whom they have more favorable expectations. After all, if you think a kid is dumb and can't learn, you're not gonna put yourself out to try to teach them very much. Two other factors though make a difference. One is the response opportunity factor. That is, kids get more of a chance to respond if the teachers expect more of them. They call on them more often. When they do call on them, they let them talk longer and they help and shape with them uh, the answers that the kids uh, speak out kind of working together to put the response out the last is feedback the feedback uh, factor works in this way as you might expect if if more is expected of a kid the kid is praised more uh, positively reinforced more for getting a good answer out but interestingly enough is given more differentiated feedback when they get the wrong answer one of the ways in which you can sometimes tell a little bit that the teacher does not have very high expectations for a kid is that the teacher is willing to accept a low quality response or it won't really clarify what would have been a good quality response. Maybe because he or she feels, well, what's the use? The kid's not smart enough to profit from this additional clarification. So those are the four factors, climate, input, response opportunity, and feedback. Yeah, so, um, well, the reason I show this is because how we treat and how we think about children um, and youth matters, just, just simply how we think about it. So the Spimalian effect is, as you pointed out, was uh, this a warm client, a climate, uh, more praise and differentiated feedback. Uh, they teach more material and provide more opportunities to respond to questions and they work together to get the right answer. And so now I want to, uh, introduce positive youth development, and then we'll come back to the Pygmalion effect. So uh, there's three real standard things, caring and supportive relationships, high expectations, and meaningful opportunities uh, to participate. These are the foundational, uh, the, the kind of the core of positive youth uh, development. And when you kind of compare the positive youth development to the Pygmalion effect, you can see caring and supportive relationships that played out in, you know, a warm client, climate, 
more praise and differentiated feedback, these higher expectations, so they teach more material. And higher expectations should not be confused with um, you better do it or else kind of an attitude. No, this is higher expectations is we believe that you can do this with the right supports in place, you can do this. And then meaningful opportunities uh, to participate. Uh, teachers provided more opportunities to respond to questions and they work together to get the right answer. And so this is why, uh, so I, I show this little piece here because I think it's evidence that supports that positive youth development is a, an appropriate uh, framework to be working with young people. And I think uh, kind of as a society, we need to take on uh, this idea of positive youth development. Uh, when, and especially with uh, the focus on number three, what does meaningful participation look like? Um, because this is where I think as we start to kind of unpack, again, all the complicated ways in which a young person may end up in a situation like this, um, we can uh, certainly look at uh, how society kind of looks at young people and views young people and, and how we, the opportunities, the pro-social opportunities we provide for them or the ones that we don't provide for them. And so uh, specifically with organizations who are looking to, um, uh, you know, kind of bring young people in as, as part of even a board or uh, an advisory board of some sort, this is a heart's ladder of youth participation, I think is a very good um, kind of measure to help us kind of stay on course, like help us understand, like, are we, uh, you know, how meaningful participation are, are we really doing here? And so the first three rungs of this ladder, so the first level, young people are manipulated, young people are decoration, and young people are tokenized. Uh, so Hart, and I would agree with him, uh, suggest these really aren't participation, right? These are just really uh, using young people for the benefit or gain of, of something else. So, so this is the first, but I think they're important to have on the ladder so people can kind of do a, a self-reflection on this. Like, are we really, uh, uh, allowing young people to participate with us, or are we doing some of these uh, things here? So fourth level, young people are being assigned and informed. So they're being uh, assigned tasks to be involved in projects and they're being told you know, what it is about, the reason for it, so that they understand what they're doing. Uh, the fifth level, young people are consulted and informed. And so this is, uh, again, building on level four, we're assigning tasks. Well, in this fifth level, we're actually asking young people what those tasks should be. And again, making sure that they're informed. And then the, the sixth level, adult initiated, but shared decisions with young people. So adults are coming up with ideas, but they're in consultation and sharing decision-making with young people. That's how the decisions are made. And then seventh, young people lead and initiate action. And this is what we really wanna see young people kind of doing on their own. And then finally, bringing it full circle back around to all this young people and adults share decision making. This is where we're just working together as a, as a community, as a society to, to solve problems. I have seen this um, ladder represented just through this seventh uh, level. And, and uh, I would say that's not, you know, it's, it's not about, for me at least, it's not about young people being in charge, but it's, a, but it's about sharing power with young people because they bring a perspective and new ideas and new ways of thinking about things to uh, the challenges that we um, have in, in our communities. So Hart's uh, Ladder of Youth Participation. But of course, there are always uh, obstacles to this. It can be hard. Um, and one of the biggest reasons we just don't train young people to be decision makers, you know, all the way through uh, even in high school, for the, for the most part, young people are just told what to do, told where to go, what to do, what to, what to be involved in. And they, they don't really build these decision-making skills. And this is a skill set that needs practice. They have restricted access to institutional systems. So oftentimes young people can't even uh, engage with the systems that they're a part of. Uh, uh, you know, schools are... Um, uh, while they are often welcome at school board meetings and, and things of that nature, but there are some structural, quite a few structural barriers in there that make it difficult for uh, young people to uh, get involved. Uh, inequality and, exclu and exclusion. We have uh, certain subgroups of uh, young people who have an even more challenging time uh, navigating uh, these institutions. And then uh, kind of this uh, cost myth, uh, people will often throw this, it's too expensive, it's too time consuming. 
uh, you know, it is time consuming. Um, and uh, if, if time is money, then yes, it is expensive. But if we really want to get to uh, good ideas and ideas that will actually be helpful, I think it's something that we just, we have to overcome. And then there's just ongoing stereotypes uh, and oppression of youth. I don't go too much into detail uh, in here. Uh, I, I have a whole nother uh, talk on stereotypes and oppression of youth, but we're kind of incapable of thinking and caring for themselves. Uh, they have limited legal rights and, and they are talked about. Again, they're, they're often not at the table uh, of these things. So, okay, so pathways. So now some of this, the next part is gonna go a little bit quicker. Uh, and if it feels like it's going too quick, if folks can just, uh, someone can jump in and just ask me to slow down, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so I wanna talk about US incarceration. If we wanna reduce homelessness, we need to reduce uh, uh, incarceration. And this is where I talked earlier, even the adult homeless population is, this is a big issue, but I think it, for a lot of those people, even in the adult world, it starts uh, when, they're, when they're young. And so incarceration and homelessness are mutual risk factors to each other. Study methodologies vary, but researchers generally estimate 25 to 50% of homeless population, population has a history of incarceration. And certainly with the experience that I've had working in the field, uh, it would be closer to 50%. And so this is something, this is a topic. So uh, our prison populations has been a topic for some years now. Um, and we know there are some reforms going on and you can see you know, back here in the eighties uh, where this crime starts uh, really jumping up and it's really late 2000s that we start to see, we're through some criminal justice reform. We start to see some tailing off of um, of this. And so there are some promising um, reforms on, on, out there uh, for folks to see. Uh, however, though, at the at current rate of reduction, uh, even by 2091, uh, we're not even going to be close to being back down here in the 19. I mean, it, it would take us 150, maybe even 200 years at this rate of decline in order to get back down to, to these kind of levels. So criminal justice still is a huge uh, um, problem. Uh, compared to the world, here's the United States, uh, 710 per 100,000 residents is who we incarcerate. The next closest is Chile at 266 and all the way down. Um, again, I'm happy to share these uh, slides with you so you can see some of this more detail here, but we really stand out as, uh, uh, as incarceration, an incarcerated nation. And this is the same thing for young people. Um, 336 uh, per 100,000. Now this is just a, a little bit dated. This is from 2008, uh, but some of the recent numbers I've seen, this is like around 286 right now. So still far greater than any of these other countries when we're talking about uh, the numbers of under 18 years old in, in custody. So these are minors. Yet crime rates have been dropping. Uh, you know, they dropped down here and there, and then really from the mid '90s, uh, and this is about the time we did start passing all this get tough on crime, uh, and crime started dropping. But yet arrest rates did not drop with them as one would expect them to do. Um, and so now I'm going to kind of uh, so criminal justice system, and then this I think ties into the school, but through this, uh, and I think you've probably heard about this, this school to prison pipeline. I'm gonna talk about that uh, real briefly here. And this really comes around with these zero tolerance policies. So they started in the nineties, again, get tough on crime, three strikes, you're out, mandatory minimum sentences. And we really started trying young people as adults. Um, so again, these are minors. And when you have zero tolerance policies, severity of penalties go up and rehabilitative alternatives uh, are diminished. And so uh, here's some uh, suspension expulsion rates and it's doubled since 1974. This is from the 2015, 2016 school year. Again, these numbers are uh, notoriously difficult to get out of the US Department of Education. Um, I'm not saying they're trying to hide them, but they, they are definitely not easy to find. Um, about 2.7 million suspend in school suspensions in that school year, around 2.2 million out of school. Uh, suspensions, around 130,000 uh, expelled. And of course, black students uh, two, are suspended at two to three times the rate of white students. And students with disabilities are, two, are uh, suspended at two times the rate of their peers. And a single suspension or expulsion doubles the risk of a young person repeating a grade. And the biggest predictor of, of dropping out of high school, one of the biggest predictors, 
is repeating a grade. And so we're already kind of setting uh, young people up. They're being suspended. They're being expelled. School is getting hard for them. Uh, it, it, it doesn't take a, a leap to kind of think about what, um, uh, how this could lead to a, a young person just thinking like school is just not for them. Uh, and of course, hugely disproportionate amongst communities of colors, uh, who is getting suspended. Um, and I know Portland Public Schools has, has, has had an issue with this. Um, and, uh, and one of the interventions that I'm gonna talk about here is one that they're advocating for. So these strict uh, discipline policies, zero tolerance, school resource officers, the presence of, even though the, the research is mixed on this, but there does seem to be that this presence of a school resource officer tends to have, schools tend to have higher, uh, young people are more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. So uh, random searches, this results in increased sanctions against suspensions, expulsions, which results in decreased educational success, grade retention, dropping out, failing to graduate, which then leads to increased criminal involvement, and then finally in incarceration uh, and or homelessness uh, in, a, in, a lot of, in a lot of times. Um, so, so increased risk, I'm gonna check my time here. I might jump over a couple sections here. So homelessness, so the increased risk of high school dropout, 42% of youth experiencing homelessness uh, drop, uh, had dropped out of high school. Uh, there's uh, increased risk for long-term criminal activity. These young people have very few legitimate means of engaging uh, in employment, especially if they're uh, uh, a minor. And so one in 10 male high school dropouts uh, will be in juvenile or criminal justice versus one in 35 male graduates. Dropouts are three, three and a half times more likely to be arrested than high school graduates. And 68% of all males uh, in prison do not have a high school diploma. And then uh, drug addiction, they're at higher risk for drug addiction, even though the research is mixed, but it certainly doesn't get better. And, and I'll say the research is mixed both on mental health and substance abuse. Because I think it's I think it's pretty difficult to ascertain whether did one cause the other. How's the causality happening here? Is the drug addiction or, or mental health causing the homelessness, or is the homelessness kind of causing the mental health and, and drug addiction? So, and these have huge economic impacts. I'm just going to talk about uh, high school dropouts. Uh, this Cohen did a really good job of uh, estimating these costs. He looked at lost wages, lost fringe benefits societal consequences. So this loss of social cohesion, when we have a high school dropout, uh, and if they drop out of our community, you know, who this young person, you know, may have uh, been some, uh, you know, invention of technology, medicine, or some other knowledge that could have benefited our community. So we've lost that. Uh, and they're, of course, way more likely to use public services like welfare, TANF, and child care. So it costs us there. And I'm going to skip through these two. You can go back and look at those if you want to. And so but I just want to point on this, just a high school dropout, $469 to $750,000 is total cost to the community uh, over the lifetime of that person versus that person being an active contributing member of our society and paying taxes and things of that nature. So, um, and of course, high school dropout is much more likely to be a career criminal, heavy drug user, and um, so the, the cost could be even far more expensive. And even if it's even a 10th of that, that's, you know, that's still way too much. And, uh, and it's something that we, those dollars could be way better spent in the school systems, I think, than, than uh, out here in the criminal justice system. And then a final thought on education. So this is from uh, last year. Uh, so 34% uh, of children entering kindergarten lack the basic skills needed to, to learn how to read. 65% of uh, fourth graders read below grade level, contributing to 8,000 students dropping out of high school every day. And 37%, only 37% of students graduating high school, uh, graduate high school at or above reading proficiency. This to me is uh, frightening to think that, that, that uh, our reading ability is uh, uh, for our young people. Um, and, and this is a topic I've only recently uh, got involved with. I'm not sure if folks are familiar with the reading wars. And, uh, and I guess this is something, and again, I'm, there may be some teachers in here that could tell you way more about this than I can, but it's this idea that I think like back in the 70s, we shifted uh, from this uh, idea of teaching 
uh, reading uh, from a phonics perspective to uh, what they call a whole word or a look say perspective. And I know uh, some people have criticized that as, um, as being the reason why our young people can't read. Um, why did that thing? Whoop. Why our young people can't read. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, Dr. John McWhorter, he's a linguist at Columbia University, says specifically this is the wrong way to teach uh, uh, black kids how to how to read, um, and, and is problematic for a lot of things. So, okay, so I am going to now. What can we do? I don't have uh, time. I've uh, as usual. I went. I got way more than I, than I wanted to do, but I'm going to fast forward through to. Uh, well, no, I'm not going to show that. So restorative justice, I'm, I'll just go and then I'll stop here. So restorative justice in schools. And again, this is something that Portland Public Schools uh, voted to implement in the 2019-2020 school year. And of course, it got blown out of the water by COVID. But this restorative justice is really, I think, a, a different way to think about discipline in schools. And I think most importantly, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's the message we're sending to young people, this message to them. And when we're incarcerating young people, when we're expelling them and suspending them, I mean, we're, th there's a message that there's something wrong or we're afraid or they can't be trusted. But th through things like restorative justice, we start sending this other message that they are, they're part of a community that we, that we care about them. Uh, so it focuses on righting a wrong, committed and repairing harm done. The goal is to place value on relationships focus on repairing relationships that have been injured. The victim and the wrongdoer have the opportunity to share with one another how they are harmed as victims or how they will work to resolve harm's cause. And, and this is so important. And even in the larger context of our society today, and I'll just kind of end on this note, that um, when we talk about cancel culture and, and these kind of things, you know, this, this inability like we, we don't even want to hear apologies anymore. That's how jaded it seems like we've become. No, no apology seems to be good enough. And this is, uh, and this is just um, frightening for me. So, I mean, I, I cannot imagine a society that can thrive if it rejects this idea of forgiveness. Um, like uh, Dr. Sam Harris uh, refers to, uh, you know, forgiveness is a miracle. It's a miracle that we can resolve these conflicts through apologies and forgiveness. And so I'm a huge proponent of, um, of restorative justice. And uh, again, I have some evidence uh, behind this slide that you're welcome to look at around how it has benefited schools and their um, reading and math scores. Uh, but for now, I think I'd like to um, stop sharing and uh, open it up for um, some questions. Oh, Don, thank you so much. That was, uh, you gave us so much to think about and what a major problem. We all, we have several questions. So I'm gonna read uh, uh, a few here. I'm gonna start with Rengas. What is the connection between single parent families and youth homelessness? Is it a strong cause and effect issue? Well, you know, I don't, I'm not aware of anyone that has looked at that specifically, um, but I know that, that there is research out there just on single parent homes and depending on what your socioeconomic status is, it's not good. You know, if you're upper middle class or, or, or above, being a single parent home has no, seems to have no bearing on how well a child will do in there. But if you're poor or working poor, being a single parent home really matters. So uh, socioeconomic status has a lot to do with that. Okay. Um, from NADA, 15 to 20 years ago, there were studies that showed that children from non-religious families were least likely to be involved in the criminal justice system. Do you have any statistics regarding religion and homelessness? Uh, you know, I don't. Uh, and as a, um, you know, as a social worker and just how I oriented myself practicing in the field, um, I mean, I worked with all religions, right? If this was a, a young person or an adult, you know, if this was something that was important to them and they felt would help them thrive, I mean, I, I always supported those, those kind of things. Um, I think, um, so yeah, so I'm not familiar with anyone that's actually looked at that intersection of religion and, and these issues. Okay. Uh, for Mr. One, uh, what role does, can the private sector play in resolving some pain points of, uh, of uh, runaway youth, uh, homeless youth? And um, 
and that, uh, some of the gains, oh, monetize, monetize, monetize some of the gains. So pri the private sector play in resolving some pain points of runaway youth and monetize some of the gains. Um, well, I, I'm, I guess I'm not exactly sure what monetize some of the gains means. Yeah. So maybe they can add, they can add that. Can you come in? Uh, yeah, Mr. sure, Juan, Don. Come on in. So the private sector uh, theoretically is I take the risk, I reap some of the rewards, right? Of course, uh, we can get into an argument about, you know, if, if that's actually how things work. But um, you spoke about, you know, the government spending the money and ultimately the government can reap the rewards in increased lifetime earnings, increased taxes, you know, more social stability. But how can the private sector, I'm just curious if the private sector does or has an opportunity to do something in the future and or, or today? Well, I guess I'd approach that in a, in a couple of ways. The first thing is um, even with those benefits, so yeah, the government benefits from that, from taxes and things like that, but as communities, we benefit too, right? Our, our own communities, if, if there's fewer crimes, fewer drug use, we need less police force or a local tax dollars can go to different things and stuff like that. We don't have to, we, you know, our, our communities are safer uh, to walk through. We have more community members who are engaged in the, in the political process of shaping our communities and land use issues and those kind of things. So I, I think that's, that's that we benefit very personally, very locally when, when uh, from, if we can resolve uh, things like this. And then I think how private, one way that private, um, industry, I think, can help is really start rethinking how they think about young people and their capabilities and really throwing the door open on internships, paid internships, opportunities, and not just opportunities uh, to, um, I mean, certainly menial labor needs done. And I, and we all have probably done our fair share of it. And builds character is what I was told. <laughs> I'll go with that kind of thing. But but also making sure that, that these young folks are are becoming uh, integrated into leadership roles, right? We teach them to be leaders, to be decision makers, to problem solve these kind of things. So, and I think that's why we're seeing a, a real problem with this labor shortage right now. I, you know, young people do an economic, uh, I mean, people are like, well, go get a job at McDonald's or something like that. Well, these people, these young folks have done that and they're not gonna do that anymore. It can oftentimes be dehumanizing beyond belief. Um, these corporate structures, if they're gonna, uh, look at that as a job opportunity for young people, then they need to be teaching their managers how to actually supervise folks. And uh, because I think that's the biggest reason why young people refuse to work in those, uh, those industries is because management could be horrible. S sexual harassment uh, can be a real problem in, in some of those things. So, um, so that's some of the ideas, I think, private sector. I hope that answered your question. Yes. I'll think about it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. come back. But, but I, for, I forgot to uh, let folks remind folks how we work the Q and A. But um, you can either put your name in the the chat, or you can type your question in the chat. So for the, any of you that are new to this uh, format, that's how we do it. Um, but Suzanne, you have a question. Come on in. Yes. Uh, thanks, Don, for the very thorough presentation. Um, you just ended with that restorative justice. And I was wanting to hear an example of how that's applied, like restoring the harm. How is it worked? Well, if I if I, I had a about a seven minute video I was going to show you that shows it. So Oakland Public Schools implemented this back in the late 2000s and had really huge success with it. Um, so I guess what I will uh, say, I, I will share these slides uh, with someone here that they get to them and then you can go through it and, those, and play those videos and stuff and kind of see that. Uh, because, because honestly, there's, there's quite a few different ways that it can uh, play out. It can be uh, community conferencing, it could be community service, it could be peer juries, it could be the circle, the circle process, it could be peer mediation. So there's a couple of different models within restorative justice that it could play out. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, are you uh, here's a question from let me get my from uh, Jamila. Are you familiar with home plate youth services in Washington County? If so, can you talk about how their work is helping? Uh, yeah, I'm quite familiar with uh, home plate. So they're kind of a, um, a, a drop in model of those models that I was talking about a drop in model. 
So you've come to them and they're open at different places around uh, Washington County, although I think they're getting ready to just do their own place now. They kind of would be in a different church on different nights of the week. And it would all be around like this evening meal was kind of the, the main thrust of this. So young people would come for this evening meal. And I can tell you, food and meals could be an intervention in a lot of these things. You know, we, we, it's an important part of community, right? And so, and then through that process, building relationships, trying to get them into some longer term services, but keeping them come back for, you know, hygiene, first aid, those kind of needs kind of things. So, um, yeah, I'm quite familiar with um, the executive director. Uh, um, I think I've known her. Well, we were in a class back in like 2009, I think, mm -hmm. together at Portland State University. So, um, yeah, they're an organization that does uh, great work. And they're actually coming out this way a little bit and providing some services for us out in Western Washington County in Forest Grove uh, mm -hmm. for young folks. Wonderful. Thank you. Joyce has a question. Some individuals can empathize, empathize more fully than others, and it may be a difficult skill to teach. Uh, dealing with classroom disruption is not easy for many people. Uh, this is an uh, ongoing issue in teaching preparation. Um, I think just, I think Joyce is, Joyce, you can come in and give any more information, but just how do you prepare teachers to, for social justice rather than discipline? And there has been a lot of work in that area, but I'm not sure. I've been out for 20 years or more, so I'm not sure where we are now. Mm -hmm. Well, my kind of mantra that I uh, put out there is let teachers teach, right? And I think we've kind of, uh, and this is the same critique I think we can put on police departments too, is we've, we've asked police to do too much. We're asking teachers to do too much, right? That they're outside. And I think they, they could use some help. And I think there's ways to strategically use behavioral health support in schools that could reduce the kind of behaviors in the teachers are gonna see in the classroom. I also think restorative justice uh, could help that kind of uh, behavior as well, because this starts to create a different culture within schools. It's a different way of thinking about young people, how young people think about each other, how they think about administration. And so I think those are the kind of things that will kind of tone all that down. I think those behaviors that teachers are seeing are from a whole host of, of issues ranging, not just from, maybe zero tolerance policies within the school, but outside the school too. And I just think that's too much to ask teachers to do that. We, we need to kind of rethink these roles that we're, that we're doing there. So I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with Portland street medicine? Can this be one form of outreach? Yeah, I'm not overly familiar with them, but yes, that's a street outreach uh, kind of, uh, but, but those folks are, uh, I think those are the, I don't know that they're just adult, but they're doing both kind of things, if I, if I understand right. No, yeah. this is exactly the model we need to be moving towards, you know, and this is modeled, if, if I understand it correctly, this is modeled off of, you know, Eugene has had the CAHOOTS uh, program down there for 25, 30 years. They have data that, 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 I mean, they're saving their local police department millions of dollars every year because they come in and take care of these issues because they're the ones trained to do it and they leave the police force out of it. So, yeah, I'm a huge proponent of those models of, uh, of intervention. So, um, yeah, so let's see, I had two questions. Let's see if <laughs> it's up. okay. Uh, one is, um, so you said that 46% uh, of these kids didn't finish high school or 40 something, mm -hmm. which means that over 50% did. And I'm wondering um, if there's anything that can be built into the high school curriculum that might actually help these kids stay off of the street. And my other question is, um, you know, it seems like in many ways we've seen that some of these are due to lack of various things in these kids' lives as they're growing up. Um, are, are we trying to then patch up? Are we trying to give them what they were lacking uh, before? Or are we just assuming that, uh, you know, so they don't have those skills now and we're going to uh, kind of add some other skills to make up for it. Are, are, we trying to, are we trying to fill in the gaps or are we trying to make up for the fact that those gaps are there and, and et cetera? I, that's a very vague question. But. Well, well, I think to, the, to your second question, <clears throat> I think that it's, uh, it's a two pronged approach, right? So the, the interventions, the people that are working with these young people at this point in time, it's kind of too late to go back and try to fix those things. So we are trying to essentially be 
the family, right? We're trying to teach them the things they need to be successful uh, in the world. But then there's other pe folks that are working on policy changes, right? Who are trying to, to implement things that, and some of these things we may not even think are associated with, uh, with, with young folks, but anything from even like parental leave, uh, you know, any supports that we can give uh, work in, uh, working families uh, is gonna benefit these young folks in school and in, in life. So if we, if we can just think about any of those uh, legislation and policies, it's gonna help folks. Uh, it's gonna help these young people. It's just gonna translate to them. And then your first question, could you- uh, was, It was basically, um, a lot of these kids make it through high school and then end up uh, going out to the streets. Is there anything more we can do in the high school environment to kind of maybe give them the tools they need to not end up on the streets or something? Well, I, I, th I think it comes down to this reading thing. And that was kind of that one slide I showed. If only 37% of seniors are, are at reading level, that's problematic. You know, that's, uh, that's a huge amount of our young people who are going to struggle in life. If, if you're struggling with reading, well, then we know they struggle with all their other courses, right? In fact, reading tends to be one of the highest scores in school. So if only 37% are proficient in reading, well, then they're probably in the teens when it comes to math and other science kind of stuff. So, so I think this focus on reading, and, and again, I talked about these reading wars that are going on right now, and, and I'm not a part of it. I'm just trying to understand this idea. I think that needs to be looked at, right? Why are, why are we having these paltry reading uh, abilities coming out of high school? I think that's number one. If, 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 yeah, go ahead. Well, well, I was just gonna say, um, I, I just remembered something else you mentioned about John McWhorter. Um, and I know that he has a very, uh, has an opinion of you know our problems today and how they're not, uh, a lot of them are from low expectations from certain kinds of, populations, et cetera. Um, so, and, and you did bring that up a little bit about, you know, how higher expectations or at least belief that, that certain people can succeed uh, factors into this a lot. So you think that's a, that's a big part of this? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, again, there's so much going on here. It, 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 it can be a little reductionist just to go in and say, oh, this one thing kind of stuff. I think we want to be careful about that, uh, doing that. But, um, but reading and, and low expectations, uh, I think, are, yeah, are damaging our young people across the board. And, um, but, that's, but, uh, but I'm not laying that on the back of teachers either. Right, that this is a, a funding issue, how we think about this, where schools are built, how schools are funded, this whole idea of how we fund our schools through property taxes, maybe that should be revisited, um, <clears throat> thought about more. So um, yeah, I, I would agree with that, absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We had a program a couple of weeks ago called on uh, Word is Bond, a young man, and that was his whole presentation basically is, you have to have high expectations, support and high expectations. Yeah, I am. A, I'm a little bit familiar with that program. Um, I think we placed a student there or we're trying to place a student there a couple of years ago kind of thing. And so I looked into what they were doing and I, I thought it was a fantastic idea. Yeah. And he is a former teacher, uh, the gentleman that is the executive director and the, uh, he's a former teacher. He got out of teaching and started started this group. Oh, so, uh, yeah. I didn't ask your question. Okay. Well, is there any difference between the single kid families and multiple kid families in terms of factors which may lead to underperformance or leading to the problem of homelessness? Is there some sort of link between these things? Any research on that? Yeah, I missed I missed your the very beginning of your question. Could you repeat just that first part? The it's a single kid family, one just one child. Uh -huh. And then the other one, multiple, more than one, there are siblings are there. So does it have any relationship? Does it affect in terms of uh, problems of underperformance? Yeah. Or other things? Yeah, you know, I am not aware of any research that has uh, looked at those. And, and I think what... Um, I'm skeptical of that. I guess I feel that the research that's out there, it's just been such a range like this seems to impact regardless of those things. Um, I will say socioeconomic status has a lot to do with it. Um, but uh, middle class and wealthy folks are not immune from uh, these challenges as well. So. <clears throat>
Gretchen has a question. Come on in, Gretchen. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I'm beginning to feel like I'm seeing the same Indians coming over the same hill. I'm 81 years old. And when I was in school, they had initiated something called the, the, the word recognition type of reading. Yeah. And I remember coming home and needing help from my father. And he said, go over there and sound it out. Yes. Uh, of course, I, I was crying to my mother after a bit. So I don't understand. <laughs> and she said, no, we were taught differently. We were taught phonetics. They're not teaching you phonetics. But I had the feeling that, you know, people in my class could read. And we were doing pretty well. So I'm wondering if they just somebody might be using this as a stick. And if they'd looked farther back in the history, maybe they would be able to get take the stick away because I don't think that's the cause. What I'm wondering about is this uh, all of the stuff we have that's de that's delivered to us non verbally. People yeah. spend so much time listening to things, <clears throat> becoming in some ways an oral culture and a picture book culture. So I just wanted to make that input and, and uh, raise the question. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Yeah, that's that uh, that whole crux there around the, the, the teaching, how to teach to read. And um, I guess in my mind, uh, you know, I do a lot of program evaluation and stuff. To, to me, I don't care what they use as long as it's working, right? And, and when I see 37, only 37% at reading ability, I would say, it should at least be looked at. It's not the only variable, it's, but it's one because another big one, and maybe you've heard about this, is like just how many words a, a, a kid will hear before they enter a kindergarten. And there's that 30 million word thing out there that if from middle-class families, a kid will hear around 30 million words by the time they enter school. Uh, someone from a working class family or poor will hear about 3 million. And they're thinking like right there, that's the deal. It's, it's already too late. At that point, now there is some uh, pushback on this 30 million word thing, so it's not as clear cut as I might be saying it. Some people critique that idea, but I think it's right there that preschool, kindergarten, first grade. By the fourth grade, if they're not at reading level, I can't imagine that you can pick them up again. Like they're not going to. Like there, there's no books in the house. They're not interested in reading. Mm -hmm. This has profound effects on the, the pro-social options they're going to be able to. Uh, participate in as, as they grow older. Mm -hmm. And our final question is from Mike Roche. How can we educate um, the youth, the homeless youth about relating with authority figures? We need to, sh uh, to show them that distinguishing leadership from tyranny. Well, if I'm, I thought I understood your question, but that last no. part maybe I didn't. So if I don't. I may have read it wrong too, but okay. uh, I'm one of those 37%. Uh, but how can we educate um, run, uh, the RHY youth about relating with authority figures? And Mike, come on in if I need to explain that a little. You need to explain. Okay, that yeah, I probably didn't uh, write it right. <laughs> um, yeah, just I think there's a lot of uh, kids who have had bad experiences at home or at school and where somebody didn't uh, teach them how to behave, but just what to do mm -hmm. and all that. And um, I think that carries with them and who, I mean, not everyone can be a leader. So they're gonna end up following somebody. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people, especially on today's social media, uh, who are very loud and get people's attention far more than more thoughtful people who can actually lead them to better, uh, better life. Yeah, and well, and I think that comes from an experience and whether it's in school or family or both, <clears throat> a young person starts developing a, a, very, a resistance to authority, right? Mm -hmm. They just don't trust them. Authority has never done anything for them, right? They've never helped them out. They've never helped them thrive in any way. They've always been in their way or hurt them in some way, shape or form. And so they develop this unhealthy view of authority and that carries with them uh, when they are, I would suggest carries with them when they live on the street. This is one of the key reasons for those street outreach programs, right? Around de developing these relationships where young people actually start trusting us again, right? And, oh, I can trust somebody. Oh, I can trust this institution. But that takes a long time, right? That takes a, a long time to get these. Yeah, well, I see all these ACAB. Really, I've never done much. All cops are bad. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, attitude. 
Mm -hmm. And it's just like, you have, it seems like you'd have a lot of trouble finding a foothold in that attitude to change it for the better. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you can critique the police all you want to, but we got to know how to get along with them because here they are in our communities, right? And they're, they're a part of our communities and stuff. And so, yeah, teaching young people out there. But it's like a lot of things, right? They've never met a cop that treated them with respect, right? And, and so to kind of facilitate some of those interactions, they never met an adult that treated them with respect. Uh, yeah, never... When I was with uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, my attitude is um, it, to a kid is if you want to uh, want respect, you show respect. But you also should show that kid what it's like to be respected. Yeah, exactly. This is what, because I would never encourage someone to uh, be talked to in a demeaning way. You should not put up with those kind of things and things like that. But teaching a young person how to do that in an appropriate way and not just, you know, flipping out, I think is part of the job that we're doing, right? We're raising them and it takes a village, right? And so I say, let's be the village and let's all help raise these young folks. Mm -hmm.